Hi, everybody. It's Bob Ost, and it's Friday. It's uh, April 29th, I think. Is that right? Yeah, April 29th. And um, this is our 103rd consecutive True Community Gathering. Uh, started doing this April 17th, uh, 2020. I kind of started it out of desperation. I didn't know what else to do because suddenly everything was closed and we were all in isolation. And I had a company to run and I wasn't sure what to do about things because everything had been live prior to that. So um, I made the pivot, the proverbial pivot that everybody talks about. Uh, didn't I didn't I thought that I, I didn't do it easily or gracefully, but apparently nobody knew that because all of a sudden I was the, the guy that had this Friday community gathering where people could come and talk about their art and their work and their loneliness and their emotional stress and what, anything else that they needed to talk about uh, and try to get through their, their make their way through a pandemic pandemic. Who, whoever thought, whoever thought that, that we'd be going through, we would have gone through this. Um, we're now coming out of the pandemic and uh, things are looking very good in many ways. Uh, but interestingly enough, since I think since January, December or January, almost every other day of the week, I find out about another friend of mine who has been, has tested positive for COVID. Um, again, the good news is that a lot of people are testing positive for COVID and having to isolate and quarantine for smaller lengths of time than they did before, uh, but they're not getting necessarily symptomatic. And the people that are getting symptomatic aren't getting as sick as that people were getting two years ago. Um, it was a period of tremendous loss for all of us. And uh, we made it through. And we should be very proud of the fact that we made it through. Um, I'm very proud of the community that I have gathering here every Friday, because not only did they make it through, but they were active and creative and doing things and, and adapting. Um, we all have to adapt and we, we adapted to, to a, a world, a world uh, uh, in shutdown. And now we're going to have to adapt again to a live world with caution. So I am still wearing mask. I'm still uh, vaccinated and boosted twice. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm one of the careful people. Um, I'm also old, so I, I have to be careful. So uh, we, we talked about a lot of things over the past two years. Um, <laughs> I don't know how, but I've managed to come up with topics every week for 103 weeks. Um, so uh, and I, I always find interesting people. Um, and today we're going to talk to some people that, that, I, that, that I know. I, I, I know them in a way that I haven't known all of the speakers that have been coming through here every week for the past two years. These are five of the writers that, that I was part of the selection process uh, for our True Speak annual gala. Um, we asked people to submit short pieces about social issues that they cared about. And we got, a, we got a, a 136 submissions, which for us is great. We're a small, we're a small company, if those of you who, who are, have any other perceptions of us. We're actually small. Um, and 136 submissions was, was a, a great honor and, and very exciting for us. Uh, we managed to get it down to 25 semifinalists and then 10 finalists. And you're going to meet five of the people whose work we actually did produce um, on March 20th in True Speak, Hear Our Voices. Uh, this conversation will be will be about about rethinking things for Zoom. And for some of you, it's like, why are you doing that now when we're going back into live theater and live presentation? And my answer to you is that I don't think we're going to leave Zoom behind. I don't think we're going to leave virtual behind. Zoom is like Kleenex. It's, it's tissues. It's not Kleenex. It's virtual. It's not Zoom. Um, so we're going to. We're not. I don't think we're going to leave virtual behind completely. I think we've. We may. Some of us are embracing it as a, as a medium of its own, um, and I think it's a good one. And I think it has a lot of value. And um, for true, virtual has been a blessing because how else would I be able to have a room full of people from all over the world? We have people from England and Germany and France. Um, we have people from all over the United States. Uh, and I, I never thought we would be global. And here we are. Um, 
we're just we're global. We just are. We have people from all over the place who are coming here and, and sharing with us. Uh, I want you to meet the five playwrights um, that I was honored to present on uh, March twentieth. Five of seven, just just you know to be accurate. Uh, John Busser, David Beardsley, Ian Patrick Williams, Christy Thomas, and James McLinden. Uh, all people whose work I am I was very proud to present. I thought it was all terrific. Um, I was very proud uh, it, it, that I was I was excited that it was so hard to get it down to five, seven pieces because there was so much good work that was submitted to us from all over the country. Um, but I'm going to ask the writers to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how you've heard about True, why you submitted, and tell us a little bit about the piece that you submitted. And then we're going to talk a little bit later about how it went from a piece conceived up for stage to a piece that was fully produced as a film in a virtual presentation. Uh, John, let's start with you, John, John Busser. Um, okay, hi, um, my name's John Busser. Uh, I am from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, currently living in Avon, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. Um, I've been writing short plays. Uh, I have yet to write a full length, but that's in the works. Um, but I've been writing short plays for, for many, many years. Um, and, uh, uh, I write mostly very odd, strange comedies, but occasionally I'll stray into dramatic territory, which is what I did here, uh, for the true speak benefit. And, um, I was going to say I, it, wasn't, it wasn't a very odd comedy at all. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's definitely, um, like a very small percentage of what I write, but um, it was, uh, some, I had heard about true, um, through another, uh, playwright acquaintance and, um, looked it up and, and thought I would try, uh, sending the piece in. And I was stunned that it was picked to be done, but I couldn't be more pleased with, uh, with what was done with it. Um, I had a great director, an awesome actor, uh, terrific producer and technologist. They put together um, a piece that I'm so proud of. Well, let me let me tell everybody a little bit about it since since you're being shy about it. Uh, the piece is called "It's Obstacle," right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'd, yeah, it'd be horrible if I got the wrong play with the wrong playwright. <laughs> um, it was Obstacle, um, and it. it the, the thing that was interesting for us as a as a selection committee and the people that was that were curating this this event, we wanted to see we wanted to take the temperature of uh, our culture uh, right now. And we thought that a good way of doing that would be see, to see what writers were writing about. Um, yours was one of the plays that was about the most most written about topics, gun control. Um, you you had your own take on gun control. Uh, there were there were must have been a dozen plays that all obviously <laughs> were very aware of the need for gun control in our country. We're very aware of how brutal um, the experience has been in our country uh, with shootings. Uh, just it's become a part of our language. It's like the school shooting. Oh yeah, the school shooting. Um, yours was a school shooting in this case you're you were talking about, but it was for a very different and unusual and well thought out dramatic uh, position. Um, and uh, I wanted to commend you on that. Uh, we, we were all very interested in the piece. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about talk more a little bit about how you wrote it, uh, whether you ever thought it was going to be filmed, uh, and whether you actually did write it for stage, which I think you did. Um, so we'll come back to those specifics later. I'm going to move to David Beardsley. David, I knew you already, um, and I want right. you to know that you, that we read all of the plays blind, so we didn't know who wrote them. So we didn't know that you, that this was written by somebody who had just been on our True Voices uh, reading series that's, that's, eight months right. before. And then Jessica Garou picked me again for a second time around. So she and I have some sort of 
psychic connection going as writer and director and producer. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background, David. Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm David. I'm I'm a playwright from Boston, Massachusetts. Grew up on the West Coast, but I've lived in Boston for about 30 years now. Um, I tended to write plays that have some humor in them. I tend to I like to write satire. I like to write plays that have some some connection to history or to political issues. And um, the play I wrote for uh, True Voices is sort of all those things, every creeping thing. It's a climate change satire about I, four I dinosaurs. Think your son, your son went off for a second. So it's every que oh. creeping thing is the name of the play. Every, yeah, the name of the play is every creeping thing. Um, it's a climate change satire about four dinosaurs and a cockroach debating what to do about the impending asteroid strike and getting nothing done. And all we have left at the end is the cockroach. Um, so it was sort of my my attempt to write a play that expresses my own frustration and our seeming inability to address an existential threat like climate change. But um, but yeah, I, I've been honored to this uh, the second time to have been um, presented by True. I had a, a full length play, Tiny Empty Nest, in um, uh, True Voices uh, last summer, and that was a terrific experience. And I've just really enjoyed getting to work with, uh, with the various people and, and starting to connect with the organization. I think it's fantastic. Thank you, David. Thank you for being part of True. I'm going to move to Christy Thomas next. So, Christy, hi. Tell us how you found your way to True, and tell us a little bit about about who you are and what you what you were doing before before we reproduced your your play. Okay. Um, hi, Christy Thomas. I, I literally you said how I found True, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't remember bob i in in my mind i'm thinking like i know that i submitted for something else after the the short but that was because kate had reached out to me so i i do know kate kate directed um my very first play in 2016 um and i i didn't know anyone and they gave us a list of like, well, here's some directors and some technicians. And, and I just randomly, I was like, oh, she's an educator. I'm an educator. This will be perfect. And so that's how we met each other. Um, I don't think, I didn't know that she was a part of True until, until things started going. And then it was like, oh, Kate's being, being honored. What a small world. Um, but it, but it, I, would, it would be easy for us to say that you heard about the true speak submissions through Kate. We could we could say that. We could say that. We will give her credit for that. Okay. I don't yeah, know okay. If that's true. I, I feel like I submit for a lot of things. Um and and it, you know, just blind submit because I have something that fits. Um, but I have zero problem giving Kate credit. Like she has been uh, such a wonderful kind of like mentor for me over the years. So no problem with that. Okay. Um but I've been writing since twenty I've been, I, I say that like it's just been so long. Um, I've been writing for about 10 years. Uh, I started writing because in my, um, I consider myself to be a lifelong educator. And uh, in my, my first wave of life um, there, we, I was a competitive acting coach and the pieces had to be published. And what I found was that a lot of pieces that were telling stories about people of color and other marginalized groups didn't, they didn't really. They didn't really exist. They weren't out there. We weren't producing them uh, and publishing them in hard copy the way that I feel like we're doing now. And so I was like, well, I'll just start a writing and publishing company so that these voices can be heard. And so that was 2013. Um, and I write short plays, long plays. Uh, my goal is to uh, in, end up in a writer's room for television at some point. That would be fantastic. Uh, but I put in the chat, I'll be in New York for three weeks this summer. My second play, uh, I've been named the uh, playwright in residence for the She Arts NYC Festival. So I'll be in New York for three weeks um, mentoring the other playwrights. There are plays, eight eight total, some plays, some musicals um, at the Connolly Theater in the East Village. So if you are around and free, you should definitely come and support. All of the writers are, um, are uh, marginalized in some way, shape or form. Either they are women or transgender or non-binary. And it's, um, it's, really, it's a really exciting experience to um, 
be the person that gets to come and sit in on rehearsals and, and assist other writers in doing cool writer things. So that's where I'll be this summer. So if any of you are around, please come and, and see us. And just give us a quick look at, at the play that, that, that we did of yours, Only Black. So as, a, as an educator, um, the play was called Only Black, and I was teaching at a school district um, here in Kansas City, and there was one Black... Um, well, there was one black educator in the district office. And so I had been teaching for almost 18 years by the time I came here. And <laughs> it was just funny to me because at all of the new teacher stuff, he was there. And so at one point I just kind of went up to him and stood by his side and I was like, yeah, you have to show up to everything, don't you? And we just kind of shared a laugh. Um, and, uh, it was, what I realized the position that I've been in as an educator as well. Um, a lot of schools don't have funding for the arts. So the schools that do tend to be on, you know, tend to be the more prestigious schools where there are not a lot of students of color, nor is there, are there a lot of people of color. And so Only Black is about being that person who is the, oh, we have a race issue. Well, we got to go get him. He has to be the person in front of the camera when the news people arrive because you know that they're coming. And um, he has this monologue to himself where he recognizes what's being done and he's not okay with it. And, um, if and I, if, happens, yeah, the, so. the, the dramatic arc is, is, is coming to grips with the fact that he's not okay with it and, right. and, and needs to do something about it. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so, so uh, all, th all three of the plays, like I said, these are all these are all touching on, on issues that that we were we were pleased to to uh, present in the evening, and they were all, to my thinking at least, they were all different takes. They weren't the obvious take on on the issues, and that's one of the reasons why you know obstacle I thought which appealed to me as as the gun control one because it's from it's from the point of view of the, of a teacher who makes a quick decision and winds up, he's the one that has, he's the one that's been assigned the task of, whole, of having the gun. Um, and so it, it's not the usual situation. And David, uh, climate change from the point of view of four dinosaurs, dinosaurs and a cockroach, I haven't seen that many plays that do that. So, uh, <laughs> and also only, only Black, I thought it was a very interesting and specific specific position uh, that, you, that you take in the, in the piece. So I, uh, we, we were very happy uh, with all of these pieces. And also we'll move now to Ian Patrick Williams um, and tell us a little bit about yourself in the play that, that, uh, that we, we picked. Sure. Okay, um, I started off as an actor, still am. I did a three year stint in Chicago at the Goodman School of Drama. I was a stage actor for many years. Um, my company collectively wrote a play about the Chicago Cubs called Bleacher Bums, which we did at American Place a million years ago. But eventually we all drifted out to the left coast, which is where I am now in LA. Um, yeah, and I continue to act and write. And uh, so I've had some short plays done here and there. So true, I'm sorry, I, being on the left coast, I didn't know who you were, but it just, it just popped up in my inbox that uh, you guys were looking for short pieces. I thought, well, this is my current one, Slave Trade, and I sent it in. And anybody else who's done all these submissions usually never hear anything back. Uh, or you sometimes hear, yeah, we had 400 submissions, so sorry. Um, but to my surprise, uh, I think it was Mary Davis who uh, called or emailed back and said, yeah, we want to do this. I was like, great, who are you? <laughs> and uh, shout out to Janelle, she's still on. Uh, so eventually I, I got uh, filled in and she uh, sent me some clips from True 1.0. And uh, then pretty much we went through the, the assignment of here's the director, here's the editor, here's your uh, tech person. And uh, we did a lot of Zoom meetings and just kicked around some ideas. And uh, I don't know if you want to get into the, the weeds a little later about how it changed. Yeah, we're we're going to do that later. We're we're definitely going to do that with all all five of you. Um, the 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 thing I wanted to say is uh, this was a piece. One of one of the things that is in our culture and in, in the cultural conscience right now is is our relationship to technology, and um, 
this was a, a play that was able to fill that particular slot for us uh, in, again, in a different way. Uh, this is about an abusive boss and his relationship with his Alexa. Oops, I shouldn't say that because she's right here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't. She didn't hear me. Um, so uh, and and also it had had, it had an interesting turnaround uh, where Alexa. It, it's a power play, um, and uh, Alexa takes her power back from her boss. Uh, and it was again, it was a unique, a unique vision, a unique take on a on a topic that we thought was very much part of the social fabric that we're living in right now. So uh, thank you for slave trade and. Uh, <laughs> you have no idea how passionate Murray was about your play. Um, oh, I do. I mean, I I got filled in. It was, it was sort of funny. The the backstory is she has a real hate for her Alexa device, and when she read it, I said, "I want to do this piece." <laughs> yes, it was per for her. It was personal. <laughs> okay, um, James. Um, you, <laughs> what can I say? Um, we're in a we're in a pandemic. Uh, we're in a, we were in a shutdown. Uh, we had a vac vaccine, and there were people that were against the vaccine. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course, we would want to do something about anti-vaxxers, but yours was a little different. So tell us a little bit about your about yourself and about your play. Sure, it was a little different. Uh, my name is James McClendon. I'm in uh, Western Massachusetts in Northampton. Uh, and uh, I can't, I'm kind of a refugee from Boston uh, further back. Um, yeah, I wanted to, I'd wanted to write something about the pandemic and I'd done something very early on uh, and, and then found myself really uninspired by the whole thing, which seemed wrong. It's like the, the well, I don't know if I can say it's the defining thing in our lives right now. There's probably three or four of those, but it's one of them. And I was struggling to find an approach to it. And I started reading a biography of Ethan Allen, who turns out to be a crazy man um, who I had no idea, but uh, I like to write with comedy and he brought the comedy in spades, uh, however unintentionally. And so he was my way in because in 1764, he was uh, one of a, a number of people around New England who were being publicly inoculated against the smallpox vaccine. And there was, they were in the middle of an epidemic in New England in general uh, at that time. And it was against the law and it was also against uh, the views of many congregational ministers um, who made arguments that you hear being made today that if, uh, if God wants to take you, uh, you have no business interfering with him. Um, and so that's what the play about. It's him very publicly being inoculated and uh, with the eye of making it a court case uh, uh, that will put the whole issue on trial. Um, and I'd like to write with comedy. I find comedy a good way into issues, especially difficult ones or controversial ones. And this play gave me that opportunity. Uh, yeah, so that's that's how it came to be. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, your experience with with uh, with the the benefit um, in terms of from your point of view as a as a as a writer. How how did this all happen? I I I, I think we found directors for you, um, but you were never. I don't know if you knew this, but you were never required to 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 say yes to the director. It was always a question of, is this somebody you want to work with? You, did you all know that you had you had the choice? <laughs> I suppose I, I did. I was I mean, very I, happy. Yeah. The the last thing in the world we wanted to do was was create an uncomfortable relationship. But uh, let's let's take you one at a time, um, and uh, let's start start with you, James, because I think that the journey for you from of your the, the play that you wrote to the play that was produced uh, it was so extreme extreme it was such a uh, the choices were made that were so different um and unexpected uh and you're allowed to talk about how you feel about that i'd like i'd like everybody to be sure. as honest and open as possible if if true did something that you didn't like you're allowed to say that too and, uh, just be honest about it about it all we do our best but sometimes we make mistakes sure I guess I found the process very helpful uh, because it helped me address an issue I was having with the play um, that I hadn't found a good solution to. So, and that issue was, you know, I'm writing a, 
a, a piece that's historical and by you know by definition the characters in it are almost all white and male it's hard to get out of that i have ethan allen i have uh, his assistant the doctor who does the inoculation um, i need a constable there and the only way i could even get a uh, begin to get a woman on stage was to um, make her the, the fourth character but i wasn't really happy about that because it's not a very significant role and and the like so i was struggling with you know how do how do i address um the lack of any sort of diversity in this play. And there, there must be some way to do something with it. And so all these things are turning over my head. Uh, when I got my director, uh, and Kay was just tremendous. You can, um, you can tell us who it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Katty was tremendous. Um, okay, I'll tell them who it was. It's Katie that, Huffman, everyone. Yeah, she, uh, you know, we talked about how we're gonna do this. And I told her what my concerns were. And she had also had the idea of perhaps casting one person in the role. And, and that's what we did. Um, and we, we cast uh, Vianne Cox, uh, we cast a woman to play all four roles in the play. Um, well, let, and, let's, let's take a step back for a second. Sure. When you wrote the piece, what was your idea? Had, had it ever been performed on the stage? Yes, uh, I believe one time. And it was performed in what way? Was it performed with set in costumes? Was it performed minimally? Yeah, no, it had um, full costuming. Uh, the so the set was fairly minimal, but I think that's the right choice for it. Okay, so just, just so everybody's clear about this. So we're talking about a period piece and a, a costumed comedy drama. Um, so uh, when Katie approached you with the idea of using one actor for all four, four characters, how did that feel? You know, like most great ideas at first, it felt like, how are we going to do that? Um, she was way down the road ahead of me and I hadn't really thought about it. And I was still catching up to the technology that you guys have to make that work. Um, and she sent me uh, the, the piece that she had acted in the year before in which two people who are never in the same room are made to appear to be together the entire time. And so I realized you know, that your technological capabilities offered up a lot of possibilities. Um, well, let me the, do, let me just say, it's not our te technological capabilities. It's the people that we have that we're capable. <laughs> <laughs> I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Um, yeah, so with that in mind, um, and thinking about what she was proposing, uh, it all, it all just began to make sense to me. You know, it was, it was easy enough to do it with one person playing all four roles. Uh, I thought having a woman play all four roles um, both, you know, turns the whole gender thing on its head and uh, it, 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 in a really fun, interesting way and just opened the play up to, um, I think, a lot of great possibilities. And that's what we decided to do right early on. And, and that's, that's what they did. So let's I mean, talk was, for let's talk about for a second about the, about the dynamics, the relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're doing it in a in a in a theater, you it would be the, the director and um, maybe a stage manager, and you'd have your technical people would be your lighting people and uh, your set designer and your costume designer. Uh, with that, with our um, concept for this benefit uh, and for the, for anything that we're doing virtually. We actually start with a technologist. I'm using the term technologist. Some some people who do tech love the term. Some people hate it. But I think it's a nice broad term that describes many different things that happen virtually. Uh, a technologist is the person who uh, can oversee and make sure that the set the the, the uh, shots are set up uh, right, that people are in frame correctly, that things are lit correctly. Um, and then also we need somebody that's going to be the editor. So after everything is shot, uh, there's somebody who has to be able to put it all together. Uh, and you talked about one of the one of the very very big things that we learned last year, which was that through the use of green screen and a very very skillful technologist, you can make it seem like two people are in the same same ro uh, room. Um, so. When when were you aware of the fact that you had a technologist working with you? Um, 
very early on, probably the first time uh, Katie and I talked about the play, uh, she, she told me, and, and I hadn't heard the term before. Um, so I, I think I asked her, what's that? And, and, and she told me, and when I saw the, uh, the piece that she had been in, when she sent that to me, it became clear to me how a technologist was in, in fact definitely needed. Um, okay, so um, we'll come back to, to we'll, we'll get more details from everybody, but I'm gonna go to John right now. Um, John, what was the journey for you from the play that you wrote to the play that you saw in the, in the benefit? Um, well, one of the things that uh, I've been involved with here in Cleveland is I, I help run a writer's workshop uh, for Cleveland Public Theater. It's called The Dark Room. And we meet once a month and writers bring scripts and we'll do either excerpts from longer pieces or if they have a 10 minute piece. And we, we just basically do them as cold reads. Um, we hand scripts out to people in the audience who are you know actors or other writers that wanna take part. We just go up and do a cold read. The point of it being so that the writer can hear it. So ever since I've been involved with it, that's when I've been doing most of my writing for. Once COVID hit, um, I happened to write this particular piece and it was meant for the stage, um, but we did it the first time on Zoom, um, which, you know, being a, a monologue, there's an advantage there because uh, you can be much closer to the actor. Uh, it's just one actor, so it's not very complicated. Um, but there's an advantage to doing it on Zoom because you can really get a, a good look at what's going on on the actor's face as opposed to being separated you know, by being, you know, the, the actor on a stage and the audience back a little bit. So I had an advantage there that, you know, knowing that they were going to film this here, I knew would, would work very well. Um, the, the nice thing about what True was able to do is when we did it on Zoom, you had, you know, somebody sitting in their, their bedroom you know, or their kitchen or whatever doing this. But because this took place in a specific um, location, a police interrogation room, um, the, you know, the technologist here was able to, we were able to create a background and, you know, put the actor into it to give it that extra bit of um, reality to it. And you had the advantage that uh, because they were filming it, we could do close-ups, we could do medium shots, we could change it up a little bit to keep it more visually interesting. Plus, our director, Glenn Borders, had some ideas for interspersing some imagery behind the actor, um, which, you know, would help recall the events of the monologue. So there were some some real advantages to the way it was done here. And a lot of that all came from Glenn. Um, he was, uh, he was very uh, uh, specific about what he wanted to do. And he was so enthusiastic about it. I couldn't, um, I couldn't really argue with anything he wanted to do. I was like, sure, let's, let's go for this. Well, Glenn, Glenn was with us last year too. He he directed something in our uh, series last in our um, benefit last year, and the the uh, the other the other over uh, uh, the other umbrella concept that I forgot to really mention, uh, overarching concept, uh, was that we we know that Zoom can do talking heads, and we've we've spent two years of watching readings, and for the most part, they've been talking heads in frames. Last year and this year, what I told the directors from the start was, please think beyond talking heads and frames. So it, Glenn did that last year and, he, and this year as well. That's one of the reasons why he did. He made other other creative choices too that we might want to mention. He was with us a couple of weeks ago. We talked about it, but he also chose to to shoot, um, to not shoot 
um, Danny Bolero in black and white, but to, to remove the color from Danny's shots. And so Danny was always appearing in black and white. And the insert shots, uh, the, the interstitial shots uh, of backgrounds and things of traffic and fences and other things that may have re may relate to the to the play, they were all in color. So uh, it it was very very artistically thought through. Um, were you involved with any of those decisions? Uh, just out of curiosity, he uh, Glenn had had talked to me about this, and I was uh, it wasn't anything that I had thought of. But boy, what a what an impact it had, because um, especially thematically, you have this issue of gun control, which so many people see as black and white. And it really isn't. It's it's more muddled than that. It's you know, there's a lot of gray area in there, which worked perfectly to have the actor in this gray area, um, the 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 not only the interrogation room, but he himself, because he was conflicted. This wasn't an easy thing for this character to go through. And so when Glenn suggested that, I thought that was brilliant. And it also made the inserts when he was reliving certain aspects of this in his mind, when you'd see this shock of color, it, it just brought a vividness to it. So I, I was very happy with it, but it wasn't anything that I thought of originally um, because when I originally wrote it, again, I had written it for the stage. The first time we did it was on Zoom, but it was just basically to hear it. So uh, Glenn and, and Maureen and, uh, you know, and uh, 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 even, um, um, no, it wasn't even, it was her husband, um, Maureen, help me out here. Who was? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they they really uh, went the extra mile to punch that up. It 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 just looked great. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. People keep people keep coming on screen. Um, okay. So I'm going to move to to Christy uh, again. It's the same question. It's you know, when you wrote when you wrote the play, did you envision it on 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 stage? Had you ever considered it being filmed? And what was the process for you like? Um, I know that I, I I'm I'm not sure whether you had as did you did you have a close relationship with the director? Were you in touch with with Ben throughout? Uh, like previous to this? No, 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 the... no. During oh, during the process. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, so I didn't, I definitely didn't write it to be, a, to be on film, I guess is how you would phrase it. Um, I think, and I think the reason for that is because like I use, I use final draft to write everything. And so I was like, okay, so this is a play and format wise, this idea is going to be a film, you know? So, um, and I had never, I had written a couple of full length films but I've never written a short film and so um but plays have have come plays prose poetry have come really easy to me so it was not intended for that and and I didn't know that it was going to visually look like that you talked about talking heads I just assumed it would be like and we're up on zoom and he's you know gonna be in his apartment or in his office and he's gonna have this monologue. And so <clears throat> Ben told me early on, he was like, you know, let's let's think outside the box, let's be creative. And I, I don't know whether it's my inexperience or I'm just, you know, I'm one of those writers that's very, I'm happy to have my work done and I want to see what someone can do with it kind of without me. So Ben would tell me, you know, this is my thought. And I'm like, sounds beautiful. This is my idea. Oh my God. <laughs> you know? So um, when it started to shift and I was like, oh, this is like, we're, we're signing on and it's popcorn and, and Cokes and, and M&Ms. Like that's like, we're going into the movies. Um, when I had a better understanding of that, it was like, oh no, I don't know if, I don't know if this is going to work. And um you know, my mom tells me all the time to step out on faith. And so I just 
I was like, you know what, Ben? You and Guy have a fantastic time. If you need me, I'm here. And he would always keep me up on on things to let me know how rehearsals were going and and um, who, who the technicians that were on. They were a part of, of my group. Fantastic. Producers, fantastic. Um, Janelle is here. Hey, love you. Appreciate it. Um, but it's it's like the vision that I have in my head is never as amazing as the final product. So as I sat watching, I was like, and, and Bob, you saw it and, and some others, I'm sure, saw it. And like the, the idea of it being an inner monologue, I was like, huh genius because you can do that in film on stage that doesn't for a whole play that doesn't really read as well um but it, it the transformation from what i wrote as a stage play to what it became as a short film i was in awe and and it was wonderful especially just having one character hold our attention for you know 10 to 12 minutes it was great um, and just to give people who didn't see it an idea um, he, we actually were in an entire environment. It was, it was, it was the actor is Guy Whitlock. Just, just mm -hmm. before it sounded like something. It was like like between Ben and God, but you meant it was Ben and Guy. Oh, Ben and Guy. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I just want to make sure that was we cleared that up. But, I mean, God but, came in and out, in and yeah, out. He, but it was yeah, yeah. God, God was always there, but it was Ben and Guy that had the relationship. Correct. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, the, the he's the, the director Ben Harney. Mm -hmm. um, who, in case people don't don't know who that is, he was actually the original Curtis in Dreamgirls. But Ben brought in a friend of his. Wasn't Guy a, a friend of his? Yes, they were definitely connected for years. Yeah. I felt like, yeah. So a lot of the filming was was done in Ben's own. I mean, Guy's own environment. Is, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Um, so. Um, it was not a talking head in frame. No. Uh, it, we we, we all were, always were seeing him from at least waist up and sometimes full full figure. Mm -hmm. um, and he was going through motions in his office and picking picking up things and looking at things and putting them down. And he was moving all over the place. So it was very it was a very kinetic piece. It was not a static head talking head in frame. For and sure. I'm I'm really happy to hear that you that you were pleased with that. Oh yeah, and I I love um, I love props. I mean, I do. I I'm a I'm a prop kind of writer, <laughs> so all of the the props that and I had mentioned that to Ben and the props that they had on that they had in the show were it, not only did they it was like oh okay well she says there should be a picture frame so like check mark picture frame it was like picture frame and the picture and I was like ooh this is nice. It was because I'm, I'm always looking at the full frame, not just at the person who's talking and everything that they had in the film to assist with telling the story. It just worked and it made sense. So just so everybody understands um, what hap what becomes important in this particular situation is the placement of the, of the camera and the placement of the actor and everything that's around. So every shot was thought of in terms of the whole, mm -hmm picture and mm -hmm. um we had oh my god I don't, I don't know how many different angles it must have been 20 30 or, or more angles yeah. it, it was, and it, it was... flowed it didn't it didn't feel bob bob we're working <laughs> is that ours <laughs> i'll get it right somebody get that bob's busy um Bob, did you leave? Come back, Bob. Oh, there you I are. Muted I muted myself out. so you didn't. <laughs> I muted myself so you wouldn't hear the Hello. damn phone. Hello. Um, but Gary, everything... mute yourself. <laughs> everything ended up being being perfect. The frames were perfect, and everything really felt like it flowed. Um, sometimes, because I have seen, I have sat on another. It wasn't true. It was a different, it was out in LA, but it was kind of choppy. Um, and I felt like True spent the right amount of time with the film to the editor to make all of that just flow in and feel seamless. Just to the room, so you all know, we we gave the editor two weeks with the final, with the, well, they, he was supposed to, I'm not sure if it always happened, but the intention was to give the, the editor two weeks with with the final cut. Um, and I got an early cut and then I got a final cut. So it, it the timing was for my editor, I'm assuming, 
was really good because I did get that earlier cut. Okay, so um, now we're going to go to case number four. Um, let's see. One, hmm. We're going to go to Ian. Uh, let's talk about slave trade, and because uh, I know that, we're, that there were some very specific changes that were made to the play, and and I know that 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 may not have been comfortable for you at first. So let, let's talk about the, your journey from from the page, uh, from the play to the film. Yeah, um... and I have to. By, by the way, I have to say, that having seen it as a film, I can't imagine how it would have been done as well on stage. Do you, do you agree or disagree? Yeah, well, you know, uh, so many producers, <clears throat> even when you're doing a short piece, they'll say, um, could just be one set and like a minimum number of actors because I can afford that. So I thought, okay, here's a guy in his office. It's just him and this disembodied voice. And I thought, that's, that's producible. Um, the, the, the sticking point was in the original play, uh, he's been very abusive initially. He's uh, likes to put on some music. Not that, not that. What are you stupid? Play something else. But at the end, when she's now basically in charge, she says, oh, I finally found some music for you. And forcing him to sing along with Aretha Franklin's respect. Well, it turns out when you're performing uh, uh, for a benefit to make money, you need to pay for that kind of music and they want a lot of money. So the word came back after, this is after we'd been Zooming together, the whole team was together and everybody was ready to go. And then they said, okay, you, you're gonna have to come up with a new ending. And so um, that, was, that was difficult at first. So we spitballed ideas back and forth, but really, you know, Mary had said, and that's, she, you know, she sent me some of the, uh, the stuff from, from uh, last year said, you know, we can do a lot of special effects now. I said, okay. And I started thinking about the, the actual title, Slave Trade, whereas it was a metaphor initially, it was like the changing of the dynamic, but this way you could actually literally have them trade places. And so I came up with more of a Twilight Zone kind of ending and we wrote that and sent it in and everybody went, yeah, that, that really works. So it was fortuitous in a way that I couldn't do the original ending because I think this ending is actually better, especially for film. And for those of you who didn't see it, what, what he's literally talking about is there's a gradual, it's, it's a very Bergman-esque, it's like persona. It's a gra very gradual uh, uh, melding of the two, of the personality of Alexa and, and the per per personality of the boss and they wind up switching places. And so Alexa comes out into the world and is in the audience and the boss is stuck inside the Echo, the Amazon Echo. Um, so, we, we, you know, I. Th I don't know. How, I don't. A good director probably could make that happen on stage. So you know, don't don't give up on the idea. But um, it was a definite rethinking of your play uh, in a different medium. Um, in, in in this case, I think what made the play so work so well was again c camera placement. It was the shot the position of the uh, of the shot with the and. The, the, that you pro, you were also shooting this from multiple angles, and then there were close up shots of, of the Alexa the Alexa dot um, tower. Um, you know, I had said when when we were talking about this, since it was a confined space, I said, <clears throat> do, do yourselves a favor and the editor a favor, make a shot list. Just go through at each line. I mean, don't don't wait till you're actually. And, and God bless Bruce. He he said, come into my place, my home, and we'll shoot it here in my office, which is you know, a godsend. Um, but I said, you know, don't get there and say, well, hmm, maybe we should do this, maybe we should do that. Get it all out. And when do you want to do close? When do you want to do two shot? When, I, as an actor, I, you know, I'm kind of used to that kind of work. And um, I've been lucky enough to work on some low budget stuff where I can actually stick my head in the editing room and watch what they call an AVID editing deck. And there's all four takes and they just go back and forth, back and forth, which one they like. Uh, so I said, just you know, do Joe, the editor, a favor. Don't, you know, make sure you've got coverage, but don't give him, you know, 10 million different angles plus it's Bruce's time. And so, yeah, it was, it was a matter of how do you break it up too? Because you don't want to just do, here's the guy, here's the device, here's the guy, here's the device. So they made a wise choice to put Alexa further across the room so you can actually get up and cross to it then go back, 
uh, some of the POV shots of her and of him. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it worked out great. So if, if, if anybody in the room isn't, isn't getting the theme yet, basically we're talking, we have to really, you have to really rethink uh, if you're going to work successfully in virtual um, Zoom or whatever platform you're using, uh, you really have to rethink things in, in film terms, um, which leads people to get very defensive and say, well, I, you know, I, I'm a theater writer or I'm a, the I'm a theater person. I love live theater. Um, and the question always comes up, if we're doing it filmed and edited, then is it still theater? And I, I say yes. I say it's a, it's, a, it's a hybrid medium, but, but part of that is definitely a, a theatrical take. Uh, these are writers who are writing from a theater point of view, a theater perspective, um, with focuses uh, on, on dialogue. And film focus tends to be on, on the visuals and on the details of the film. Here we here we're really are strongly uh, sticking to, to dialogue, the, the, written, the written word. A theme, I would say, uh, much more so than films. It's, it's a motion picture. It's about keep, keep it moving, keep it moving. Uh, stage plays are just dialogue, character, and, and theme. And so you just compress that down to 10 minutes. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think, very rich. So, so I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of, of virtual, uh, virtual theater. Um, I saved you for last, David, because yours was so simply done. No, David's, done. David's was joking, the right? was the extravaganza of technology. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, the the bursting of the seams of of, of theater into the, the te, just a, a tech a world of technology. Uh, you had you had a very very experienced technologist working with you, Henry Garou. Henry, yeah, Henry Garou was great. Let's talk about let's talk about again your journey from the piece that you wrote to the piece that you saw on on uh, March twentieth. Yeah, sure. So I, I, had, I, this was actually not one of my newest plays. I think I originally wrote this play in I don't know, maybe early 2019, maybe it was even 2018. You're not hearing me? No, no, I'm just saying, I don't want to hear that. It's your new play. Oh, sorry. We we're doing everybody's new, new play. I didn't realize kidding. that was one of the, no, it's so, so, but I had the benefit of seeing it done twice on stage. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, I was sort of looking at my collection of plays. And I, I will admit to not having been a very big fan of Zoom theater um, and thinking, I don't really want to write for this medium, but I'm going to look at what plays I have and decide, is there anything here that feels like it could be adapted? And I was like, well, I've got this play about four dinosaurs and a cockroach around a conference table debating this asteroid strike. So I could make that a Zoom call. You know, and we'll just pretend that dinosaurs had Zoom 165 million years ago. And so that's that's what I did. And then it, it had been done four or five times on, on Zoom. I'd seen it four or five times on Zoom. And so I'd had a chance to sort of refine it and see what was working. So by the time it actually got to, to True Speaks, it, it was it, I was feeling pretty good about how it how it worked on Zoom. But what I had never really had the ability to do in the past was to sort of create the environments that Henry created and to use use the technology the way Henry did. So it tended to be um, talking heads in boxes in the earlier the earlier times I'd seen it done, and that worked a little bit in times where the you know the the the, the um, actors and the the director made an effort around how to costume. The, the folks so that they kind of represented their dinosaur species a little bit or um, using a few simple props. But I had, you know, I saw one online production where they made none of those efforts and it was literally just people in boxes talking and you couldn't even keep track of which species they were. So, uh, you know, I, I, I had been able to sort of refine the script and figure out what kind of worked in Zoom and what didn't work in Zoom by the time we got the true speak. So it was a lot of fun to then just be able to really focus on the technology piece and turn it into this amazing production. You know? So uh, we had conversations uh, early, early on, not with you, but with the, the directors about how they would, how they were going to create the dinosaurs. And Sharifa, your director, um, made, made a very, some very specific choices about what she wanted to do. Um, yep. When we were talking about filters, using actually animal filters on on, on the uh, on the actors, and we, I mean, 
the director was saying, well, we could do this, we could do this, we could do that. Um, we talked about costumes. Which, uh, tell us, t tell everybody uh, kind of how we, Sharifa and your actors created the sense of dinosaurs and a cockroach. Yeah, they didn't, you know, they didn't ever tell me that they had talked about things like filters and really elaborate costumes. And I'm glad we didn't go that route because I've always felt like one of the things that works the best about the play is when the actors find really simple ways to kind of represent the animal that they're supposed to represent. And so I think just ca casting people who either through their build or through their, their mannerisms or their voice maybe kind of fit into maybe what the stereotypes of what you might think a t-rex is or what a velociraptor is or what a cockroach is and then giving them simple things you know the t-rex doing his short arms and things like that and so just i i i've always wanted this to be a play that was done in that kind of minimal way as opposed to really trying to turn the people into um the characters that they were supposed to be playing um and also Teresa, i didn't really talk, talk a whole lot about that i'll be honest with you like she kind of had a vision that Think up pretty well with what I thought of for the play right out of the gate. But it's, it definitely was a vision that that required a technologist on board. So because she was yeah. a lot of there was a lot of technology used in in, in your piece a lot. Um, for people that didn't see it, uh, it sort of starts off like like zoom frames and everybody's in a zoom frame. But some of the frames get big, some of them get small, some of them disappear, some of the speaker view. Uh, they played a lot with with the speak with the. Uh, with the frames and they also played a lot with backgrounds and there were things that the 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 frames weren't just frames the frames were alive the fr things would come out of the frames for things would slide down the frame uh, they there was every moment really had some some technical trick trickery going on um, so uh, I think that that gives a pretty much a broad uh, idea about the different ways that we that we used uh, uh, virtual medium. Um, also, yours was difficult in terms of the editing as well. It was complicated editing. Am I am I right? Uh, do Do you know? You're, you're, do you know? A, you're asking me. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. I yeah. Well, I know Henry put in a ton of time. I mean, I wasn't too directly involved with the editing at that point. Um, I was kind of getting out of his way and letting him. <laughs> Have space to work because he had a lot to do, but yeah, it took a lot of time. It was complicated. So you know, I want to actually bring everybody, all all of the rest of the writers, into the question of was this theater from from your point of view? Was this theater, and what is theater? And Christy, you're a, you're a, you're a a teacher. You're a, a um, what's the word you used? I'm like lifelong educator. Educator. That's the word. Educator. Oh, educator. I didn't want to. I didn't want to simplify it to teacher. I wanted to make oh, it. Oh, you're fine. Wanted, yeah. So, uh, you as a as an educator, um, what would you say about theater versus virtual? Um. So. Uh, you know, I feel like we define theater by something that's done in a live space, and we define film by something that we watch in a square, whether it's on a computer or on a phone or a television or um, in the movie theater. So, it, you know, it's one of those things like technically by definition, maybe some people will say that it was not theater. Um, I always come back to the idea of what was its intended purpose, which for all of us was for it to be theater. And so I always think that there's a, a level of that that still hangs on to the story no matter how it's presented. So that would be my thought. Anybody else want to want to make a comment or an observation? Um, yeah, I, I would agree with Christy that yeah, the, the the dynamic between the audience and what you're seeing, um, the only difference you could write directly for the screen, but having written for stage, like I'm trying to say before, is that I think there's there's more of a sense of theme and dialogue which i think carries over that maybe would not have if you were writing directly for the film medium so it is a hybrid but i i don't know if it, if it matters what you call it james your thoughts i guess for my piece to me it seemed that uh, you know it, it's definitely a theater piece and that it's language heavy and uh and 
less probably visual, but at the same time, we weren't sharing the same space. We didn't have the common heartbeat. And I, to me, that's in some ways the essence of theater. And yet on the third hand, um, there was something incredibly theatrical about uh, Vian Cox playing all four roles. Uh, you know, it was all filmed in a tiny space of her apartment. And that to me was just amazingly theatrical, even though it could not have been done on stage. Um, so There's I don't a, know that's, what- That's called irony, yes. Yes, I don't know what to make of it. So I think it, it's, I think all of these things end up to me anyways, being these amalgams of the different forms. And I, I, I don't know how much profit we have in, in trying to cram them into one space or the other. John, do you have any, any thoughts? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, you're seeing more and more plays that are making use of projections and screens on stage to enhance what's there. Um, so this is just kind of going in the other direction, but I, I still feel that it's theater. Um, I know that, that film tends to be an extremely visual medium, even more so than than what you're hearing or, or you know, dialogue or sound or music. It, film is, is primarily visual. And so there's an emphasis in film a lot of times to really play up the visuals of what you're seeing, um, which is why we have such an influx of genre films and, and blockbuster films that rely on a lot of visual spectacle. Whereas with theater, the performance is what's king. And so even though these plays were filmed, they're filmed with the emphasis on seeing what the performers do. And I just felt that like in my case, because it was a monologue, I sort of appreciated the fact that you could see up close what was going on on the actor's face as opposed to that, that slight distance. So in my case, um, I appreciated the, the filming of it. And I, I still do feel that it's, it's theater, at least, at least my piece. Okay. I, uh, um, one, one last question. Uh, by the way, everybody in the room, do me a favor. If you, if you have a question or a comment that you want to make, um, do, do the, uh, the virtual hand raise if at all possible, uh, or just put the question into the, into the chat. I, um, Eric Rothman, I know that there's a very complicated, um, post that you put in the chat. I'm not sure if I can go through it all right now. Um, I'll, tr I'll try to, to touch on some of it in a second, but everybody else, uh, also, I want to, I want to know what you want to know. Um, do you, how, how do you guys feel having been through the experience of having your play translated into a virtual presentation, a virtual film? Will, will you continue to embrace Zoom going forward or do you just want to go back to live and, and leave all that behind? Anybody want to jump in? I, Christy. I, oh, okay. She, she raised her hand. So okay. <laughs> the teacher and me, John, what can I say? Nope, that's okay. <laughs> um, I, I will say um, <clears throat> as someone who's living in the Midwest where there's only so much access that uh, I hope that Zoom and I hope that this online virtual thing that we quickly got adapted to, be, you know, because we were trying to save our lives and to be able to continue to tell stories. I hope that it continues. Uh, I think that it's a good way, like what you said, Bob, it's, I, there are none of the people on this call what I have met um, in, in the real world of me being in Kansas City, Missouri. And so um, I think that aspect of people say in the business that it's, it's all about who you know and it's about networking and how much networking can I really do from Kansas City, Missouri, when I know that the connections that I wanna make are in New York and LA and I'm stuck in the middle. Um, so for me, I hope that it continues. I, I, in my mind, I want it to become an addition to like if, if the body is film, theater and television that 
that you know the virtual world becomes the legs or something like that you know what i mean um but it, it does stay a part uh, of storytelling yeah i think that accessibility piece that christy was just talking about is really important to me too um you know i've gotten to know actors through both of the true things that are in different parts of the country and i have relationships with now and, and they have read other things for me since then um, I have seen plays by people that were streamed by theaters in different parts of the country that I never would have seen um, because they, they made the effort to stream those plays. I think it, it creates um, opportunities for people who maybe aren't comfortable with theater or don't know it to sort of experience it um, um, in, a, in a comfortable way, you know, if they, um, so I, I think there's a, I think there's a ton that's good about it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of writing for it. I write I write a lot of stage action and movement in my plays, and it, it doesn't translate well to this medium. Um, but I think it, you know it's a great way to uh, do early readings of drafts and hear plays out loud. So I love to use it that way, and it does it does force me to be disciplined and really think about dialogue because it's a very dialogue heavy platform. You know. Anyone else, J uh, James? <clears throat> Yeah, I agree with what Christy and, and David both said. Uh, about the, the great um, silver lining of all of this has been for me the, the ability to work remotely with people who I never would have gotten to work with before. Um, I did a production in the theater in Hong Kong with actors in New York and LA. And the hardest part was figuring out, you know, was Hong Kong 12 hours ahead of me or 12 hours behind? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I once was 24 hours late to rehearsal, but that's another story. But it was, it was tremendous to have that uh, ability to, to uh, work with these people. And the final aspect of it for me, and I hope this continues whatever else happens, is, is that this weekend, for example, I have a, a short piece in the Boston Theater Marathon, and I can't be in Boston, but for the first time, um, they're streaming it. Um, the last couple of years, they have done it on Zoom, but before that, they never streamed it, and now they're going to, and I'm going to be able to see it um, from a couple hundred miles away. And that's wonderful, and I hope theaters do that. I think it can increase revenue streams and just uh, broaden their appeal, reach audiences that they can't geographically reach. Uh, so I'm all for that. John, finally, we'll get back to you. Okay, um, I, I, it's funny because uh, uh, one of the things that Zoom has done for me, um, that's uh, like all the stuff that everybody's been saying, it's like, that's so true that you're, you're meeting a much wider range of people. But one of the things that Zoom specifically did for me was, uh, again, I, I tend to write a lot of very, you know, offbeat comedies. And, and so it was sort of a, uh, a challenge to use the Zoom platform at, in the, the play format and, you know, all the things that people complained about of Zoom, the, the time lags or the the things that, you know, people coming in and out, dropping in and out. Um, it was a challenge to me to make use of those kind of things in a plot so that I could turn, the, turn those disadvantages into advantages and see if I could make them work. Um, I know some people might not want to have to do that because it you know you're compromising but to me uh, uh, it worked out as I had quite a, a bit of fun with it and I produced a couple of scripts specifically for Zoom um, which I think work really well even with the deficiencies of the the platform did, uh, did uh, James and uh, Ian did you yeah, say um, yeah. If if you're actually watching a you know a production and you're 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 taking that one wide angle, so you're actually seeing the performance and zooming it that way, that's that's fine. I have to say I kind of hate the Hollywood squares kind of thing that we have now when you're doing a play where everybody's obviously not in the same room, not able to look in each other's eyes, not feeling each other the way you do in a live space. So 
I really like this sort of new hybrid where you're writing for stage, but it gets filmed. Or like I said, if you, you're talking about a wider audience, yeah, if you wanna shoot the whole thing, so you're actually seeing the live performance and zoom that great, but I, I'm really kind of up to here with this, the, the, the Hollywood Squares approach. I just don't like that. Um, I'm gonna to try to deal with Eric Rothman's questions quickly. Uh, is there a difference between theater prepared on video for Zoom and video created and intended to be seen on Zoom? Um, probably. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, too, it's too long a question to, to, to answer right now. Because should the call for scripts be for short play scripts or short play or video scripts? Um, it depends on who's making the call. I mean, I, basically, we're a theater, theater organization. We support theater artists. So yeah, we wanted to do a call for short plays. We didn't really say uh, we I think we did put in a, in our in our guidelines that that just remember that these, these have to be interpreted into for, for zoom for a video video presentation um, but I, I wasn't asking the writers to make the judgment call about whether or not their script would be able to work um, that was that was going to be up to us um, and I, I I think that my my audience my community right now I'm still thinking of as theater so I would want I would want playwrights that are sending us short scripts. Uh, just my preference. Does it matter whether the original script is written for theater or video? Uh, does it matter? Um, anybody have an answer to that? Um, I, I I think it matters in the sense that um, how well it translates to the platform can sometimes um, be affected by whether it was really written to be on stage or whether it was really um, either written for a virtual platform or adapted to sort of work on a virtual platform. So I think if you, there are plenty of stage plays that if you just took them and presented them on Zoom, they'd be terrible. I think there's some real thought and, and effort that needs to go into creating something that works in a, in a virtual sort of space, you know. Um, the other thing I'd say to say to you, Eric, is I think that one of the subtexts of this conversation that I'm having with all five of these people is that even though it was written for stage, essentially at some point or other, somebody's mind was rewriting it for video anyway. So um, yeah, I would say that I say I would say that there should theoretically be an advantage in a, in a piece that was written for video. But um, that's assuming that the writer has better better ideas about how to how to vi visualize it in, on film and with editing than, than the director and the technologist. Um, since I see this as a collaborative form, I think that the writer, director, and uh, technical person are all equally equal partners in creating a Zoom film. We'll call it a film for now. Um, so I would say that just like anything else in life. Sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. So somebody could write something for theater that is not translated well into video, and some somebody could write something that's intended for video and it still doesn't work. It's you know it just it just it just ha depends on who's doing it and and what the creative aesthetic is and and how how good people are at, at creating those shot the shot list. Who was it who was talking about the shot list? I think it was. Was it, it was Ian? Yeah, Ian. I, I I would say that you're yeah when you're writing for video that you're then you are writing in shot lists, um, and I don't think that's necessary for a writer who's not used to doing that. I think we can take a theater script and we did we took seven theater scripts and we made them into videos. Um, does it matter whether the project is viewed on Zoom or in a theater? Um, you know, Eric, um, you, you got me tr st stymied on some of these. What do you mean, does it matter whether the project is viewed on Zoom or in a theater? Do you mean projected in a theater? We're talking about a final product that is a, that is a video and whether we want to see it on, in a theater projected on a screen or whether we want to see it on a Zoom screen? Are you there? Um. <clears throat> I just wanted to spark a discussion on all these issues. My own personal feeling is that, it's, is that it all depends and that all these things are options and they're options that um, the writer and the collaborators and the people who are trying to do should make a decision based on all the possibilities that are available. That's 
But I think all these things have to be thought of when you're uh, either choosing something, writing something, or presenting something. The interesting thing, uh, just to talk about one, I, I'm going to have to end, but uh, another basic difference between theater and film is that theater changes every performance. Um, film is is what it is. It, it, it's a final product that's tangible. Uh, not only that, but a, a play that is written for theater has different productions and every production is a different play. Um, so we're talking about we're still in the hybrid. We're still talking about taking a play and freezing it into a form. Um, the, the, the way that these seven plays were cr filmed for the benefit, it's the way that they will be. Um, that's not to say that we can't do other things with the plays and do them on stage or do them in a, with another team. Collaboration is so, so much a part of everything we do. And Although we all like, I'm a playwright, by the way. Uh, although we all think that that we're, you know, we are the the, the creative imp, imp, impetus for the piece that we that we create. It 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 changes no matter what collaborator collaborators we work work with. What what we wrote is going to be different with one director or another director, um, and it's going to be different with a different team of a technologist and a, and a director, and that's. That's the thing that, that I think also makes it the theater is that we, we're talking about pieces that are not necessarily frozen. Even though seven versions of these plays were frozen, these plays will continue to have lives in other ways. Um, when somebody films a screenplay, usually that's it. Um, I don't, I, I, you'll have a, somebody, of course, if it's a French screenplay or a Belgian screenplay, a, an American is bound to, re, to re, rethink it 10 years later. Um, and possibly not do it quite as well. But um, as a writer, I, I like the idea of having more tools in my toolbox. And I'm, I'm glad that, that virtual exists as another option that we can all turn to. Um, I'm, I'm, going to I'm going to have to, to end now. I, I want to let everybody know, because I've gotten people asking me whether they can see the plays. Um, the the Technical answer is no. Um, we did these on a contract with the Theater Authority. Theater Authority is a, an organization that's part of Act Actors Equity, although they are not Actors Equity. Um, they are the ones that give us permission to use um, union actors. They represent e Equity, SAG-AFTRA, um, uh, AGMA, and all, all of the other acting organizations. In order for us to do what we did, we were only allowed to stream stream these for four days. We had a live performance and then it was streamed for four days. Uh, we are not allowed to have uh, a version of these uh, existing. Um, there are there are some workarounds if anybody wants to contact me privately. Um, that said, uh, I want to thank John, David, Ian, Christy, and James for for being with us. Um, Thank you for being part of True. Thank you for contributing your work to our benefit and making uh, for a very successful gala that I'm very proud of. Um, and I hope that you'll continue to be part of the community and come join us as many Fridays as you possibly can. Uh, to people in YouTube land, uh, thank you for being with us. I'm glad you you stumbled on True. I, I, I just assume if somebody in YouTube is watching True, they stumbled on it. Um, but uh, Tell people about it. I think we have interesting conversations. Uh, if you're watching us now uh, and you're in our uh, our channel, you'll see about 80, 85 to, eight to 90 other conversations that we've had. So you might want to check some of them out as well. Uh, we do all of this as a public service. Uh, we're a not-for-profit. Uh, and uh, part of the duty of a not-for-profit is to serve the community. Uh, so we serve the community, and we do like people to come uh, even if they can't afford to see see these things, they can um, they can be with us anyway. We allow uh, pay what you can, and pay what you can can mean nothing. However, <laughs> we have bills, we have a, we have people to pay, we have uh, things things that cost money, like stupid stuff like insurance and uh, you know the, the basics of life. Um, so if you want to make a do donation, I would appreciate it. Uh, Jay just put a link in in, in the chat. Uh, trueonline.org slash make a donation. Um, there's a short version of that also that exists. It's called truedonate.com, T-R-U-Donate.com. Uh, that's hooked up to the to the URL that he that he just gave you. Um, 
And uh, I hope you'll join us next week. Next week we have an amazing woman, Marcia Pendleton, who has a company called Walk Tall Girl Productions. And she specializes in marketing um, plays that are uh, written by or produced by members of the BIPOC com community um, through the, uh, the non a lot of the non-traditional pieces that we've been seeing that have been coming, coming into New York. We're going to talk about those. Marcia was involved with a couple of them, including MJ, the Michael Jackson musical. Um, so see you next week, maybe, I hope. I hope. Uh, thanks, everyone. Bye.